Hello, and welcome to the first COVID-inspired BC Calculus video tutorial for Mr. Billingham's class. Uh, this is on 10.1 Power Series. This video parallels and supplements the material in our text from section 10.1. That material was already covered in class before the break. I'm repeating it for the sake of completeness. Every topic in this section is within the scope of this year's AP exam. Let's start by reminding ourselves about infinite series. An infinite series has the form a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus dot 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 plus ak plus dot dot dot, where the dot 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 means and so on forever, or in sigma notation, sum from k equals 1 to infinity of a sub k. The individual numbers a1, a2, etc. are the terms of the series. ak would be the kth term. A key tool in studying infinite series is partial sums. Let's remember how we form the partial sums of a series. The first partial sum, s1, is just the first term, a1. s2, the second partial sum, is a1 plus a2. S3, the third partial sum, is a1 plus a2 plus a3. And in general, the nth partial sum of an infinite series is the sum from k equals 1 to n of a sub k. These partial sums can be made into a sequence. We can use the sequence of partial sums to determine whether the original infinite series converges. This is important. We say that the infinite series, sum from k equals 1 to infinity of a sub k, converges if and only if the sequence of its partial sums converges. So if the limit as n approaches infinity of the nth partial sum is some real number s, then we can write sum from k equals 1 to infinity of a sub k is s, that limit. And of course, if the sequence of partial sums diverges, then we say the infinite series diverges. Let's use this idea to determine the convergence or divergence of a couple of examples. Example 1. Does the series 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, and so on forever converge? To figure that out, we have to look at the partial sums. The first partial sum s1 is 1, but the second partial sum is 1 minus 1, so 0. The third partial sum, 1 minus 1 plus 1, the third partial sum is 1 again. And in fact, the sequence of partial sums goes 1, 0, 1, 0. This is clearly not a convergent series. There is no number that it gets closer and closer to. Since the sequence of partial sums diverges, we say that the infinite series given in example 1 also diverges. What about the series 3 tenths plus 3 hundredths plus 3 thousandths plus, and in general the general term is 3 over 10 to the n, forever? Does it converge? The first partial sum is of course 3 tenths or 0.3. The second partial sum, if we get common denominators, is 33 hundredths or 0.33. Similarly, the third partial sum, 0.333, and so on. In general, the sequence of partial sums goes 0 0.3, 0 0.33, 0 0.333, 0 0.333, and pretty clearly is heading to 0.3 repeating which is one-third. So this is an example of a convergent infinite series. A specific and important type of infinite series that's easy to test for convergence is a geometric series. You should have learned about these in a previous course. They have the following form. Each term in an infinite series is a fixed multiple r times the term before it. The first term is often referred to as a. The nth partial sum would be given by the following formula. Here I've just factored an a out of each of the terms. 
we can simplify the expression on the right with a neat little trick. I'm going to divide both sides through by a and then multiply both sides by 1 minus r. If you follow the math, you'll see that on the right, when we multiply 1 plus r plus r squared through r to the n minus 1 by 1 minus r, first you get the original series back because you multiplied it by 1, and then you get the series again, but this time with negative signs, and each degree raised 1. When everything combines, the r and the negative r, the r squared and the negative r squared, and many other pairs of terms cancel out, and you're just left with 1 minus r to the n. So solving, you can get that s sub n, the nth partial sum of, an, of a geometric series, is given by the first term times 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r. What happens to the expression on the right as n approaches infinity? Well, the only term on the right that's affected by n is r to the n. And as n approaches infinity, what happens to that depends on the size of r. You might remember me telling in class about my very first calculator and taking numbers like 0.99999 to larger and larger powers until my calculator told me the answer was zero. On the other hand, if I took 1.00001 to the larger and larger and larger powers, eventually the result got so big that my calculator said undefined. It got larger than the largest number my calculator could store. So the key is, what happens to the expression on the right depends on the value of r. I've summarized the results here, but not only does the series converge if the absolute value of r is less than 1, we even know what it converges to because the r to the n term goes to 0. So we know that s, the sequence of the partial sums, will be equal to a over 1 minus r, and that's a very important formula for us. Remember, it holds if and only if the absolute value of the ratio is less than 1, and the numbers that make this true are equivalent to the values of r strictly between negative 1 and 1. This range right here is known as the interval of convergence. Let's try out some simple examples to make sure we understand how to use this technique to see if infinite geometric series converge, and if they do, what they converge to. So here are four series. They are, in fact, all geometric series. In the first one, the ratio is 1 half. In the second one, the ratio is negative 1 half. In the third, the ratio is 3 fifths. And in the fourth, d, the ratio is pi over 2. So just using the ratio test for this, the absolute value of r in the first one is a half, in the second is a half, and the third is three-fifths, so the first three series converge, but the last series, the absolute value of the ratio is pi over 2, which is a little bit more than 1.5, so the fourth series diverges. So the first, second, and third converge, the fourth one diverges. But what do they converge to? Well, in the very first one, if I set n to 1, I get 3 times 1 half to the 0, or 3 for the first term a, over 1 minus r is 1 minus a half. Well, that's 3 over a half, so the first infinite series converges to 6. The second one, the first term is very obviously 1. The ratio is now negative a half, so 1a over 1 minus r is 1 over 1 minus negative a half, which is 1 over 3 halves, or 2 thirds. The, four, for the third one, c, if I set k equal to 0, which is the first value of k, 3 fifths to the 0 is 1, so the first term is 1, and I now put that over 1 minus r, 1 over 1 minus 3 fifths is 1 over 
2 fifths, which is 5 halves. So the C converges to 5 halves, or 2.5. Sometimes geometric series can have variables in them. Consider this series. This series has the form of a geometric series with the first term of 1 and a ratio of x. So it would only converge when the absolute value of the ratio, which is x, is less than 1. And what would it converge to? Well, interestingly, it will converge to a over 1 minus r, or in this case, 1 over 1 minus x. So I've created a Desmos share that you can look at this in, and it's posted on Moodle, and it is called um, BC 10.1, and you can look at it to see that, in fact, the expression on the left and the right are in very close to each other when x is a number between negative 1 and 1. We need a definition now for power series. A power series is an expression of the form c0 plus c1x plus c2x squared plus dot 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 plus a generic term forever. In other words, it's like an infinite polynomial. If I want it to be centered somewhere besides zero, then in all of my terms, instead of being x and x squared and x cubed, are x minus a, x minus a squared, etc. That's a power series centered at a. I say it's a lot like a polynomial, but it's not exactly a polynomial. One key difference is that these power series can diverge for certain values of x and converge for others, which ordinary polynomials would never do. Ordinary polynomials are always finite for every single value. A key concept is that a power series, such as 1 plus x plus x squared plus dot dot dot, which is an infinite series, can represent a function, a simple function like 1 over 1 minus x, but only on the interval of convergence, which for that function is from negative 1 to 1. Let's look at a few more examples. Since I have a power series that represents 1 over 1 minus x, and that's 1 plus x plus x squared forever, to get one representing 1 over 1 plus x on the same interval, I can get this a couple of different ways. I can think of it as a as 1 and x, or negative x, as r. Or I can just substitute negative x into the original expression, but either way I get the following simple power series. 1 over 1 plus x would be 1 minus x plus x squared minus x cubed, and so on. I can take the power series I just created for a and just multiply everything through by x to get a power series for b. x over 1 plus x would be x minus x squared plus x cubed minus x to the fourth, and so on. To get c, just take the original power series and either think of the ratio as 2x, so I get 1 plus 2x plus 4x squared, or substitute 2x in for x in the original power series. Since the ratio is now 2x, it will converge when the absolute value of 2x is less than 1, which is the same as the absolute value of x is less than a half, so it will only converge from negative a half to a positive a half. You can play with the other examples if you want. We worked on them in class. So if we have some simple power series and the functions they represent, we can get new power series by doing things like multiplying through by x, or substituting negative x in for x, or 2x in for x. But we can get even more by differentiating or by integrating the existing power series that we have. Here's an example. The title of the example suggests an obvious way to find a power series, but before I do that, I'd like to suggest to you that there's another simple relationship between 1 over 1 minus x and 1 over the quantity 1 minus x squared. The second is the square of the first. Can you think about how to square the infinite polynomial 
1 plus x plus x squared forever. Well, just the same way you multiply two polynomials, you would say, well, what would the first term be? And the first term would pretty obviously be 1 times, well, it would be 1 over 1 minus x squared on the left. And on the right, the only constant we would get would be from the 1 times 1, which is 1. How could we get x terms? Well, you could get an x by multiplying two different possibilities. An x could be 1 times x or x times 1. Either way, I'm getting two x's. The x squareds I can get actually three different ways. 1 times x squared, x times x, or x squared times 1. So it suggests that the third term will be 3x squared. But the way they suggest that we get it is by differentiating. So if I take 1 over 1 minus x, which is the same as 1 minus x to the negative 1, the derivative would be negative 1 times 1 minus x to the negative 2 times negative 1 by the chain rule, and that is 1 over 1 minus x squared. And if I differentiate the right, I get 0 plus 1 plus 2x plus 3x squared, and so on. So that's the... Uh, the other approach by differentiating each side, but you'll notice we got the same answers. We have an important little theorem to look at. If we cut to the simple message of this, it says if a power series represents a function f of x on some interval, then the new power series that I get by differentiating the original power series will represent f prime of x, but on the same interval. So differentiate the power series term by term, and you'll get the power series that represents the derivative. We'll talk more about this later. Well, if it works for differentiation, it's not surprising that it works for integration as well. In fact, this allows us to get a power series for inverse tan of x. Let's watch the steps. think of the function 1 over 1 plus x squared. I can think of the top number 1 as a, and I can think of negative x squared as r, and that makes the bottom 1 minus r. And so I can now use that to expand out and get that a power series for 1 over 1 plus x squared is 1 minus x squared plus x to the fourth minus x to the sixth and let's think carefully about the generic term. It's going to be something of the form x to the 2n. Now, for x squared, n is 1, and I want that to be a negative term, so I want the multiplier negative 1 to the n. Now, what happens if I integrate both sides? On the left, the integral of 1 over 1 plus x squared is, of course, inverse tan x. And on the right, I get x minus x cubed over 3 plus x to the 5th over 5 minus x to the 7th over 7. And I can get the generic term by just integrating the generic term. So that would be negative 1 to the n x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1. And that is, in fact, a power series for inverse tan x, and one that's well worth remembering. I do want to point out that technically, I need to add c to at least one side. But I can test and find the value of c by setting x to 0, because the inverse tan of 0 is 0, and the right side would be c, plus 0, so I can conclude that c is 0. And of course, there's a similar theorem just like before, except for integration that says if I integrate a power series on both sides, power series representing a function, 
the integral of the function will be represented by the integral of the power series on the same interval. It does turn out, in fact, that you can sometimes pick up an endpoint, but that's for a later video. Here are a couple of more explorations to take a look at this. We want to take a look at our very last exploration by looking at a very special function. And it is represented by the power series 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus, in general, x to the k over k factorial. Now, let's take a look at f of 0. Every other term would go to 0, so pretty clearly f of 0 is 1. What about f prime of x? Well, f prime of x is, well, the derivative of 1 is 0. The derivative of x is 1. The derivative of x squared over 2 factorial is 2x over 2 factorial, which is x. The derivative of x cubed over 3 factorial is 3x squared over 3 factorial, or x squared over 2 factorial. And with a bit of thought, you'll realize that what's happening here is that as you differentiate each term in the original function, it just shifts one, and it's exactly equal to itself. Can you think of a function such that f of 0 is 1 and f prime of x equals f of x? Pretty clearly, f of x has to be e to the x. And in a later section, we'll figure out how to get this instead of just being handed it. Anyway, that's the end of the video tutorial for 10.1. I hope it's been useful, and um, I hope to see you again. Anyway, stay well, stay healthy. Bye-bye.